Hi, welcome back to Emilsmith.com. We're going to do a tabletop review of the Uberti Smith & Wesson Number no. 3 44 Russian Top Break Revolver. It is a very, very fine reproduction of the original Smith & Wesson Number no. 3 44 Russian. The Russians ordered 41,000 of these right around 1874, 1875. Uh, there's other channels out there that does a whole history on this particular revolver. But we're going to go into its features as it is made today by Uberti. One of the nice things about the newer ones is it's made out of modern steels. So it's a lot sturdier and there's a few changes to it that allow it to be a little bit stronger. One, the uh, back strap is a little bit thicker. The cylinder is slightly longer because the 44 Russian... Um, or the, the Russian model here is also offered in 45 long Colt. This particular one is in 44 Russian, as you've seen in our range evaluation. So what I want to do is uh, go over the features of it, what it does, the aspects of it that I really like. And there's only like one or two things on here that I don't like. And let's get into it. So here's some of the nicer features of this handgun. Let's look at some of the details on it. Zoom in a little here. Okay, let's look at the hammer, just for example. Look at the color case hardening on here. It's not actual color case hardening, uh, which was a process they used in the 19th century to treat metal. This metal is treated with modern technology, but they color it with a type of acid. The trigger guard has a spur on it, which is nice. The spur is actually sir, functions with me anyway, uh, two different ways. We'll go over that in a minute. The selector on whether to eject, the, the ejector selector is called a case harden. The pivot pin is what the latch is. And as we look over the weapon, we'll notice that. The sights are extremely fine. And they're also quite reflective too because they're not deep blued like the rest of it. It's very accurate. Uh, on the field, what I like to do is use a match, like a Strike Anywhere match to blacken the sights. So it gives me a much better sight picture. Also, if we look on it, turn it around here. There's a Cyrillic on there. I'm not exactly sure what it says. Maybe one of our Russian viewers can tell us what exactly this says. And as we go over to the front side, we see how bright the front side is. It's beautiful. If, you know, zoomed in, it, it kind of looks like a dime <laughs> um, that was inserted in there. It's not that big, but it's almost as bright as one. If we look at the finish, the finish on it is just fantastic. As we turn the cylinder, there's proof marks on the cylinder for from the pressure testing. Um, like I said, the cylinder rotates in both directions. And it's on half cock. And so what I'll do is, very, very little play. If we look at the cylinder gap, there's almost no cylinder gap here. This is good and bad. You know, the timing on this is great. But when it gets fouled up with black powder, it likes to gum up a little bit. I tried some black powder loads, and they were a little problematic as I went through about 20 of them. And, uh, yeah, it's it, it was a real pain to clean. <laughs> a real pain to clean. Okay, the way this thing works is really simple. Uh, it's a single action, which um, is to be expected. The 44, or the uh, the New Frontier model, later ones, also came out in double action, but this particular one is in single action. Uh, some of the things on here that I really like is the quality of the fit and finish. The fit and finish on this thing is absolutely superb. The cylinder gap here is almost non-existent. Um, nothing rattles on here, but here's how it actually works. 
If we put it on half cock, the cylinder will free spin in any direction, unlike the 1873 Colts or the modern um, Rugers and many other of the the Colt uh, clones. The nice thing about this gun as well is it's very safe to fire if you're using uh, standard operating pressures. The maximum pressures on this is about 17,500 pounds, and we're going a little bit less than that. But let's take a look at this thing. The way it works is if you want to open it, you have to put it on half cock. There's also a safe cock, which is here, which takes the firing pin off the cartridge cases, but it still keeps the cylinder locked. Once we go to half cock, it'll free spin. And from here we open it. Just pull up on the, the latch and it opens. And as you can see, that it has an ejector. Not too unlike the, um, the Webley Mark VI or Mark IV, I think. This is a really, really well-built handgun. If we look all around it, we have color case hardening on the release latch, the hammer, the trigger guard, the selector, which allows you to eject or not eject. The cartridge cases has a lanyard loop, which I really like. The pistol grips are made out of a, a walnut, which is really nice. It, they're smooth. They're not checkered in any way. There's a lot of aftermarket grips for this thing. Ivory, um, plastic, to simulate some of the original ones that were released. But as uh, far as this gun goes, it comes with walnut grips. has a 7.5 inch barrel, which is nice. And the, um, the whole thing is just really well made. So if we put it on full cock, we can see that the cylinder locks, and we can also see the nice color case hardening. We're going to take some close-ups of this. Um, some of the other finer details that they've done to this is their Cyrillic on top of the, of the rib. I'm not sure what it says. We'll take a close-up of that. There's a takedown screw here, which allows us to remove the cylinder. And like I said, there's a selector here. So here's how the selector works. So if we want to open it and eject it, that's one. If we want to open it and not eject it, we just push this down here. And if we close it, you can hear it re-engage the ejector right there. The sights are very fine on this thing. And the front sight is a bright metal, which oftentimes needs to be blackened either with a smudge pot or a match or something to blacken it up a little bit. But uh, they're made true to the original. There's no transfer bar safety in this at all. So when we, Let's see if I can do this, put on a half cock and show you. So when we let the hammer down all the way, the firing pin does protrude through the bolt face. And that's why they have, well, I don't put six rounds in it, I put five, but you can put six in there. And the only thing is you don't want to let the hammer all the way down. You want to put it on safe cock right here, which allows the cylinder not to move. And also takes the firing pin off the primer so you don't accidentally bang it and set it off and run a bullet down the side of your leg. So let's take a look at some of the other features on this thing. So the takedown is really simple. There's this takedown screw right here that we undo. It comes all the way out. You can take it all the way out or you don't have to. I don't. See it's kind of wiggly right there. So we put, put it on half cock. Open it up. In order to get it out, we have to make sure this latch is up. And we just push with our thumb, and the cylinder pops right out. 
and we can clean the barrel. The barrel on here is a little bit dirty, it has some leading in it from when I shot it last. But the rifling on here before um, I ever fired it was just super crisp, it's really deep rifling. So it really grabs those cast bullets really, really well. Also, I'm not going to be shooting any jacketed bullets out of this, although I can. I plan on using nothing but cast lead bullets, either the ones that I buy or the ones that I cast myself. So let's show you how to put it back together. There's a little plate right here. You see them? It has like a little hole in it right here. That's so you can grab it with a punch and slide it all the way out for cleaning. This is in a slight angle, so once it's in, what it will do is it'll grab the cylinder back here and not allow it to slide out. So we just take this guy. And the, the way to, you can either push that thing in, but what I like to do is just close the revolver up and it lines up the holes up perfectly and she's done it's all back together quick function check oh here's another nice little feature there's a little bar right here and when this is really interesting because I owned at one time a Smith & Wesson top break 38 Smith & Wesson which didn't have this and that gun was really really used and every time I fired it the top would open up on me it was really annoying but this will not allow that to happen it's just locked and there's no play in this there's, you know, there's a little cylinder wiggle but it's a lot less than a lot of modern revolvers so once it's cocked or on half cock it allows us to open up the gun. When it fires, the hammer recesses into it and will not allow this to flip open and allow the gun to open. I'm going to change the camera angle again and I want to talk about the spur on the trigger guard. Let's talk about this trigger guard spur right here. It does a couple of things. Um, the Russians actually ordered it like this. They asked for this specifically. And I think it's because of this hump right here on the pistol grip. Because otherwise, if you're, you're firing it and you need to... My, my thumb just doesn't reach it very well. So if you put your finger here, it allows your hand to stretch a little bit. You can cock it. Also, in the 19th century, one-handed shooting was the order of the day. Two-hand shooting, as we know it now, really didn't get as evolved as it is today. So there was a lot of one-handed shooting, and I do believe that these revolvers were meant for the cavalry. And so when I was shooting it the other day, I put about 200 rounds through it, I decided to shoot it one-handed for a whole box. And shooting it like this was okay. It's The gun fills the hand very nicely, but... If I take my middle finger and wrap it around here, holding it offhand, it makes it a lot steadier for shooting. Much steadier. So that may have been part of it too. And two-handed, you can do the same thing. Use your non-shooting hand, you know, like this or whatnot. And it's steady enough. And as we've seen before, uh, in the video that we did the range test, it's very accurate. And we haven't really even got into uh, load tuning for it yet. And uh, I want to show you guys what the 44 Russian looks like compared to a 44 Magnum and some of the cast bolts we're going to be using in it. Okay, here's a selection of bullets that we're using in the 44 Russian. This particular one here is a cast bullet. The Lee 200 grain flat point. This one next to it is a 
Oregon Trail Laser Cast 200 grain flat point. It's a much harder bullet than the ones I cast. The one next to this one yet still is the Lyman, or in my case I have the Ideal Mold, the 429-421 Elmer Keith bullet. And it weighs right around 255 grains as cast. And next to it is a hard cast bullet in the 44 Magnum. You can see the difference in length. And here is the RCBS 225 grain with a gas check. It's a pretty good bullet. It's a semi wad cutter. It's not as pronounced of a semi wad cutter as the Elma Keith bullet. The next one is the 200 grain Lee full wad cutter. The powders I've been using so far have been GoX 3FG black powder, which it's really dirty, and they call for a 246-grain bullet with 23 grains, and compressing just a 200-grain bullet on top of that is ridiculously difficult. And so I'm going to probably skip using it with black powder for that reason. And I've been using Unique and Hodgdon Clays, and I will also be using Bullseye. Now, Bullseye and Unique are, are really good powders, both of them, and Unique is a medium burning powder. The nice thing about Unique and Bullseye is they were both created right around 1895-98, right around there. And so those formulas are well over 100 years old. And so if there was any smokeless ammunition for this made back then, it would have used one of those powders. So let's talk about pressure. The nominal pressure on these things is about 17,500 and uh, we don't want to exceed that. I'm shooting them well below the maximum charge that I've read because I want to work them up. But they've shot extremely well. The Black Hills 210 grain low, they advertise a speed at about 610 feet a second. And I believe that they loaded them down that much for one, the cowboy action shooters like low recoiling rounds. And also, there are a lot of Smith & Wesson Russians out there, or New Frontiers, chambered in 44 Russian, that are not the best of shape, and so those pressures are safe for them. The 200 gram bullets that I'm shooting are probably traveling right around 700 to 800 feet a second, probably more like 830. And I can shoot a 250 gram bullet at about the same speed, using 5.5 grains unique. The 200 grain loads, I'm using 5.8 grains of unique. I can go up to six grains. There's no, there's no real reason for it because this gun is only gonna be shooting at paper and steel. So um, it's not like I'm going to be defending myself with it or hunting with it. Although I probably could shoot small game with this handgun. It's just not necessary. So let's take a look at another cartridge and compare it. So here we have Three cartridges, two of them are the 44 Smith & Wesson. This one is loaded with a 200 grain Lee, and this one is loaded with the uh, 250 grain Keith bullet. In the middle, we have a 45 ACP hardball round. So if we think about bullet weight, we have a 200 grain bullet doing right around 850 to 900 feet a second, maybe just a slight bit more if we increase the charge. And we have a 250 gram bullet doing about 825. The 45 ACP standard ball is a 230 gram bullet doing about 820 to 830 feet a second, depending on uh, who loads it. The nice thing about the 44 Russian is it duplicates the 45 ACP ballistics. Although the 44 Russian has a better sectional density, it'll probably penetrate more. But with the soft lead that I'm casting, they'll probably mushroom a little bit. I know when I hit the steel plate, they just disintegrate. Okay, let's do a 360 degree on this thing. So as we're looking at it, we can see the finish on it is, is near flawless. It's a high polished blue. It's nearly black. Is, is, there's some fingerprints and stuff on it from making the video, but the grips are really nice. 
They're straight grain walnut. You can get fancier walnut out there if you want. The um, lanyard loop is big enough to where you can tie off just about anything you want. Use a modern lanyard or get a leather one online. You can see the color case hardening and the trigger guard. Look at the cylinder, a little bit dirty. Now, although I clean this weapon, it still needs a, quite a few more cleanings. The, uh, the barrel has some lead deposits in it. Let's look at this rib. This rib is really nice looking. It has a seven and a half inch barrel, which gives us the maximum velocity that we're going to get with the pistol powders we're using. Let's go around this side. As we look at it, we can see that the sculpting on it is just fantastic. It's a beautifully designed gun. The checkering on the parts that need it, like on the release latch, are just it's just beautiful and perfect. And same with the takedown screw. So let me flip her over real quick. And so the takedown latch screw here will will go loose a little bit under firing, and so will the the um, the takedown screw. Just make sure you bring a screwdriver to the range for this guy, and this one here just needs to be hand tightened. Caliber 44 Smith and Wesson Russian. The pivot pin is color case hardened. And really, there's only three screws holding this thing together. So that's it for the 44 Russian tabletop review. If you have any questions, feel free to either ask them on YouTube or come over to the forum and we can talk in more detail. I got some pet loads up already on the forum if you, any of you um are interested in getting some low data and there's plenty of low data online that you can get in order for you to if you want to load your own and there's several manufacturers out there that make 44 russian ammunition as far as cost of the ammunition it is pricey the black hills cost me $37 for 50 rounds, but I wanted to try a box of 50 just to see what it was like. And it goes up from there. That was the cheapest I could find. And I've seen as high as $58 for a box of 50 rounds. Loading it. If you cast your own bullets, and either, even if you buy the brass, it's still, you know, say you bought the brass and um, fired it once, you know, it's already paid for itself. But if, even if you make brass from pickup brass, at the range, because you can convert 44 Special and 44 Magnum to 44 Russian. It will cost you approximately two dollars and I think six and a half cents for 50 rounds if you cast your own, because all you're paying for is the powder charge and the primer. And the cast bullet is free if you get your if you get your lead from say the, the tire store getting wheel weights. I recommend you don't shoot hard cast bullets in it because they won't expand enough to give you a good gas seal and therefore you may end up having some leading in the barrel which I got shooting the uh, laser cast. Those laser cast bullets are really hard and they're more designed for the 44 Magnum. But they're good, they're accurate. You just got to get the lead out which is a tricky prospect. Thanks for watching.